Our final discussion today is moderated by Jeremy Bloom. Jeremy is a two-time Olympian and holds the distinction as the only athlete in history to both ski in the Winter Olympics and be drafted in the National Football League. Jeremy is the co-founder, CEO of the marketing tech company Integrate and a founder of Wish of a Lifetime, a nonprofit charity that grants wishes to senior citizens. Joining Jeremy for this conversation is Emmy Award winning writer, producer, director, Brett Rapkin. Brett was director, executive producer, and co-writer for the popular HBO documentary, The Weight of Gold. Brett is also the founder and CEO of Podium Pictures. Jeremy and Brett, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jim, for, for such a, a warm welcome. And I'm just delighted to be here with a close friend, somebody I've known for a very long time, uh, Brett Radkin. Brett, good to see you. Good to see you, Jeremy. How you doing? I am doing great. Um, I want to dial the clock back to 2017 when you called me, and it's a conversation that I'll never forget, um, and it was shortly after the death of Stephen Holcomb. Do you want to share what, what you said in that conversation back in 2017? Sure. I mean, to be honest, I don't remember that too too much, but I mean, basically what had happened is, um, you know, you and I had met uh, years ago, I think prior to the Vancouver Olympics, but I know we spent some time there. Uh, we were introduced by some, some mutual friends and, um, you know, after working in, in sports for a long time, one project that we were putting together was just, it was just supposed to be a short film about Stephen Holcomb, who was the captain of the Olympic bobsled team. Uh, we were introduced by a mutual eye doctor here in Los Angeles. And Stephen had uh, survived a suicide attempt in 2007 and then gone on to win a gold in Vancouver and then two bronzes uh, four years later. So I was really just planning on doing a short film about, you know, his journey and, and, and you know, overcoming depression. And, and um, you know, 12 days after we did a big shoot with him here in Los Angeles, we'd also had dinner in Santa Monica. You know, I got the call that he had passed away, and and uh, I believe you were the one of the first people I reached out to. Um, I think I assumed that because of your relationship with with Jarrett Speedy Peterson, that it would be an issue that would uh, would resonate with you. Yeah, I mean, Stephen's death, you know, rocked the Olympic community that had already been rocked many times previously. Um, you mentioned Jarrett Speedy Peterson, a guy I grew up skiing with, just the light of every room that he walked into. I mean, his, his smile um, lit up a crowd and, you know, such a talented skier. He was an aerialist, the crazy guys that do three flips and four twists and somehow land on their feet. And, you know, Jarrett was a, was a silver medalist at, you know, in, at the, the Vancouver Olympics. And, you know, when, when he took his life, um, it, it, it was uh, a really difficult time in mind because um, several years earlier, uh, Jarrett came to me and 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 confided in me and said, "Hey, I'm you know battling demons." And he was just distraught. It was before a World Cup in Lake Placid, New York, and and um, we were both getting ready to compete the world's biggest stage. I had no idea what to say. I just thought he was having a bad night, and um, I I reflect on that experience a lot uh, with remorse because I, I wish I was more prepared to be able to to help him and say the right things. And, you know, as I looked back on that, on, on my life, I said, gosh, I, this is something I, I need to dedicate more of my time and attention to better understand um, and be able to be helpful. And so when you called me, you know, after Stephen had died and said, hey, you know, JB, is there something bigger here? You know, is, is, is this, you know, is there a bigger trend here that needs to be discussed and addressed? I, I immediately said yes. I said, Brett, this is a story we have to tell. Um, and I'm just going to, I wanted to start reaching out to a bunch of my friends in the Olympic community and just say, Hey, you know, you know, we're thinking about doing a documentary on mental health. Are you interested in participating? And I think Brett, both you and I kind of had no idea what the reception to that question would be like. Right. And I think we were both maybe equally surprised at every single person that we reached out to from the most successful folks, um, to ever competing Olympics said pretty much immediately. Yes. I, I want to share my story. Um, and be part of be part of this narrative. Yeah, I think there was very much a you know a snowball effect in a positive in a positive way of um, you know 
certainly with, with you and Michael getting on board early, <clears throat> Bodie and, and Sasha Cohen and um, some of the others, I think that we were able to create a safe space where um, because people that these other athletes, um, you know, respected and, and knew they were able to, um, to, to share their own experience. And, you know, some of the most powerful interviews or, or people that I'm most, um, you know, grateful that we were able to include. I mean, if you look at Apollo Ono, a good friend of yours who you connected me with or, or, or Sean White, who Michael was able to, to bring into the film, they don't even necessarily talk about depression or anxiety or certain, certainly suicidal ideation in those terms. But the fact that they just were vulnerable about just, you know, dealing with pressure and, and um, the letdown that, that we can all experience after a big event, in this case, the Olympics, which is bigger than anything, um, just the combination of, of different athletes and humans we had, um, I think was just really powerful. Yeah, and and I reflect back at that conversation, those early days in you know 2017, 2018, when we talked about, you know, what do we want to accomplish with telling this story, and and we kept coming back to a couple things. First, we want more resources for Olympic athletes. We want the United States Olympic Committee, we want U.S. skiing, U.S. swimming, um, all these NGBs to pay more attention and, and create more resources for Olympic athletes. But we also want to tell a story to folks who could care less about the Olympics, who could care less about athletes, but care about humanity. And I think, you know, one of the things that you, you did so brilliant, brilliantly capturing in the film is kind of this, this story and this narrative that you can have, you know, as many gold medals um, on the planet, your trophy case can be full. You can have lots and lots of money, lots and lots of, of fame. And that does not make you immune from, from having mental health issues and mental health struggles, severe depression, thoughts of, of, of suicide. And I think by telling that story, it, it, it helped to, to kind of normalize for everybody. That's, you know what, depression is not because I'm not successful enough. It's not because I didn't accomplish my goals. It's not because I don't have enough money. It's a human condition that no matter you know, who, who you are, you, you can face these demons. Yeah. I mean, you made the point a few minutes ago about how uh, Speedy Peterson was such a big personality. And as you said, lit up every room. And um, I think I had an experience in college. I was at the University of Arizona where I had two fraternity brothers uh, take their own lives within around six months of each other, maybe less. And one of them, uh, Jed Satow, his parents went on to create uh, a nonprofit called the Jed Foundation that's become a major, uh, a major foundation in, in this world of mental health. Um, but the other guy, Je uh, John Goodstein was his name. He was the life of the party. He had the beautiful girlfriend. He was tall. He was good looking. You know, he seemed to have the world um, on his side. And it's always, it's, it's shocking. It's, it's especially shocking when somebody like that you know, chooses to, to, to take their own life or attempt to, um, because as you said, it's just, it's not, it's not, it's not a simple formula of if you've got a nice car and a nice family or whatever the things are, gold medals, that's not the secret to, to contentment or happiness. Um, and some of these stories, like I think we shared in the weight of gold, just make that, make that land so powerfully, you know? And I think that's such an important step to in the direction of destigmatizing mental health and normalizing the conversation. And I think the other thing that that we were able to accomplish uh, is that systematic change that we we're hoping for inside the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic community. I think Sarah Hirschland, who's the CEO over there, who's done a nice job creating an independent body for mental health, thinking about ways to to help support uh, the mental health aspects of Olympic athletes. And certainly inside U.S. skiing, where I serve as a as a board of trustee, we've done a lot to address it as well. And so, um, you know, everybody paid attention, you know, to the way to gold. And, you know, I think it helped create some some great change, um, not only, I think, in the Olympic levels, but but beyond. Um, but, you know, I think the impact goes even bigger. And I, and I think, you know, we we saw something unique happen at these past Olympics in, in Tokyo with Simone Biles, 
um, where really first time in my memory of Olympic hi history, um, you know, a, uh, a perennial Olympic favorite um, pulled out a competition citing the exclusive reason not uh, physical health, so so not an injury um, to a body part, although you know, brain's obviously part of the body, but but more so, you know, for for, for mental health purposes. W when you watch that story, you know, play out, especially under the framework of what you've put together with the weight of gold, curious what what your thoughts were. Yeah, it was it was certainly fascinating to watch unfold, um, you know, in real time, and I think people tend to lump together, you know, Simone and Michael Phelps and Naomi Osaka. Um, there's been tons of others, Kevin Love, DeMar DeRozan, um, the list goes on and it's growing by the day. Um, but those three seem to be, you know, talked about a lot uh, in parallel. And I think while they certainly all fall under the umbrella of mental health challenges, they're three really different stories. You know, with, with Michael, you've got somebody who you know, was a superstar so young and, and, um, you know, dealt with some substance issues that were well documented and so forth, um, and went to, you know, in, in, in treatment, uh, facilities with, with Naomi, Naomi Osaka, you've got somebody who, you know, clearly wasn't comfortable with, um, kind of the media demands that, that the, the major tournaments were demanding among other things, that story is unfolding in real time, but with Simone, you know, what I want to ask you is like, not every sport, not every Olympic sport is a sport where you can get really badly injured if it doesn't land right. Now, in your skiing career, you were doing uh, maneuvers that you were in the air, almost like the twisty she talked about. Is that something that um, you or any, any teammates ever experienced of losing your bearing in the air? So Olympic athletes experience that all the time at the Olympics, all the time. That was not unique to Simone. The difference is Simone, I believe, is the first athlete to say, I, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. Like, I'm not going to go out there and cross my fingers and hope I land. Because I think 99.99% Olympians have to do that. Look, the, Olympi the, the Olympics is heavy. It is a bright spotlight. There's more pressure there for athletes than you'll ever experience in, in your athletic career times a hundred. There's nothing even close. I mean, world championships, yes. And world cups, those types of things. Yes. But nothing can compare to the Olympics because typically if, if you're lucky enough to make it there, you only get one shot. Uh, in my case, not only one shot, but it's 22 seconds. That's how long it takes to, to ski down a freestyle ski run. So you train your entire life for 22 seconds. So when you think about the, you know, the twisties or, or thoughts of, of doubt or just losing your ability, it happens all the time, but, but typically you know, Olympic athletes, you just have to kind of persevere through that. But, but, but Simone, uh, especially in the team event said, I'm not going to put my, my teammates, um, at risk to go out there and, and, and lose a medal. And I think what she did took, took a tremendous amount of courage. Uh, and I applaud her for, for, for doing that. I think that was much have been a very difficult, um, decision, but there are a lot of people, Brett, who come on the other side of this equation. And I'm curious your perspective of, of how you would address some of the criticism Maybe not just about Simone, but more more as a culture as a, as a as a whole. Because some some folks, you know, reasonably minded folks will say, um, yes, it's important to to think about mental health. Yes, absolutely, it's important to address you know depression, thoughts of suicide as as a clinical disease. But at, but at what extent do we remove the importance of of having a high degree of grit and tenacity and the ability to work through real challenges? Uh, mental challenges, uh, pressure challenges, anxiety that you feel competing at the world's biggest stage or that you, you'll, you'll feel in life. I mean, life is hard too, right? Outside of sports, like we encounter obstacles and barriers every day in our, in our normal life or our personal life, whether through our relationships or professional careers and those types of things. And there's folks who are saying, how do we you know, make sure that young kids who are so impressionable um, continue to understand the importance of you know, working through these problems and, and finding a level of grit tenacity to be able to persevere through life? Uh, that's a great question. I think that, that grit and perseverance is, is first of all, something that is um, essential to being successful, no matter what field you're in. I, I think perseverance is, you know, kind of the secret sauce in a lot of things, just getting through 
you know, doing the things that other people don't want to do and, and doing them habitually. It's also a big part of our culture. You know, here in America, it's, you know, you got to grit through things and kind of cowboy up. I mean, that's actually a term, right? Like, I think the, the Boston Red Sox used that in 2004. That was their slogan, cowboy up. But, uh, you know, we talk about, about Simone as a gymnast or, or you when you were doing the freestyle skiing. There was no safety net. And I think that's how a lot of Americans feel today. Uh, there's no safety net. You know, you lose your job, you lose your health insurance. Like, it's not like that in any other developed country, to my knowledge. And that's a big deal. Um, I think that's something we have to look at as a society when it comes to health care, mental health care. Um, we need to have some safety nets because everybody needs them at some point. Well, there's a whole new kind of breed of startups that are focused on mental health tech. And these companies are getting hundreds of millions of dollars uh, from the, the venture capital community. It's really exciting. In fact, one of them, Ginger, uh, just got acquired by, by Headspace. And these companies are now integrating themselves into the, the corporate tapestry of our professional lives and, and becoming kind of an extension to our health plan. Um, and I think that that's really a, you know, a great and important trend because there's no one panacea that's going to solve this, right? There's no one magic pill that all of a sudden, oh, well, let's just do this. And then, you know, amount to health goes away. It is a really complicated topic. And it's a stew filled with so many ingredients. And I think oftentimes um, our society paints it with a kind of a single brush. Um, and I'll give you one example, you know, in, in the football space, it's almost like, well, if somebody, you know, has mental health issues, um, automatically the society just puts it into the CTE bucket. It's like, oh yeah, well, you know, they played football and, you know, they're, they're um, having mental health issues because they, you know, got hit in the head too many times. And, you know, granted, that's, that's probably one of the ingredients in, in the stew. But I think one of the challenging things as it relates to this topic is to, is to think of it more on a, you know, full 360 degree level and understand all the key contributing aspects um, that are a play at, at work when, when we consider somebody's, you know, mental health and the things in which they're, they're struggling with. Yeah, I think the telehealth industry is, is really interesting. And I think it's something that was, um, you know, starting to get a foothold even before COVID and now has become, you know, more of a solution than ever. When it comes to getting um, therapy, you know, I think I live here in Los Angeles and anybody that I get who's a recommendation from a friend, um, they're pretty expensive, you know, I mean, it's, you're talking two, $300 an hour and usually they don't, oftentimes they don't take insurance. So, you know, it's a significant expense and, you know, we've been doing a lot of thinking of at podium of, you know, how do we try to help move this conversation forward? We kind of, you know, feel like we really made an impact with the weight of gold and, and it's kind of like, how do we stop now? Like we really have tapped into something here and, you know, we, we now, have the opportunity to have conversations like this at places like the Kennedy forum, which, you know, by the way, the first interview that I did with Michael Phelps was at their event, uh, about three years ago, uh, I flew to Chicago and interviewed Michael. And it was, it was during that first interview where at the very end, um, I always ask, you know, is there anything we haven't covered that you want to? And that's when he brought up, um, you know, that he felt the resources being provided by, uh, the organizations were, were not sufficient. And, that turned out to be something that a lot of the athletes agreed with. And, and as you mentioned, um, you know, thanks in, in some part to the film, I think, uh, is being addressed, you know, with, with, with Sarah Hirschland and the USO OPC, as well as some of the NGBs, including us ski and snowboard introducing more, more people and resources. But I hope the telehealth is a big solution. I hope that workplaces do provide it as part of their, their compensation package for their, employees. It needs to be really easy because it's not something that nobody wakes up and says, ah, today I want to spend an hour doing some therapy. You know, like it, it takes, it's hard enough to do because it, it, it requires kind of bearing your soul. Um, you know, let's figure out how to make it easy for people to, to do that. You know, you, you interviewed just really the, the best Olympians of all time, at least in this country, um, in, in the weight of gold. I'm curious, was, was there anything that that anybody said that really stood out, like upon reflection of, you know, completing the project where you were interviewing them, you're like, wow, that, that really surprised me. 
you know, what comes to mind is I, I'm really humbled and, and grateful and surprised somewhat at like the courage that you guys had to speak up about the lack of resources um, while pretty much every, not every, but most of the athletes in the film are um, recently retired, but there's a few that are still active. And, um, you know, to speak honestly about the organization that either, I mean, you're still on the board of, of USSA and, and, um, you know, I think it took a lot of courage to be able to say, look, you know, I love being an Olympian. It's something I'm very proud of, but there needs to be more when it comes to some of these issues, mental health being one of them, but some of the other things around career transition, um, and finances were other things that were, were touched upon in the film and deserve films of their own. But th that's one thing that comes to mind is just the courage of the group of athletes to, to speak openly. Where, where do you think that courage came from? Well, I think it came from a place of authenticity, which is, I, I, I think, the, the best place where, where these candid conversations can, can come from. I think, you know, one of the things that stands out to me when I watched Way to Gold and to, to the friends which watched it is like how authentic that film is. You could tell there was no scripts. You know, you could tell that the comments were coming from the heart. And one of the things that surprised me about the film that was said, I've known Sean White for a really long time. I've competed with him at two Olympics, and and uh, you know the, the Olympic circles are small. When when he said he had thoughts of suicide after the Olympics, I, that just blew me away because I would have never imagined that somebody like Sean White. Um, would have thoughts of suicide and, and be you know str struggling to the extent that he did. Um, the other part that you mentioned as it relates to you know uh, U.S. skiing and, and the USOPC, um, the the weight of gold actually you know gave me the backdrop to to reach out to Sarah Hirschland and say Sarah I want to I want to talk to you about the project that we're working on I want to talk you uh, talk to you about some of the learnings that we're finding out and it really helped kind of put this issue on the forefront of, of not only Sarah's but Tiger Shaw's. Um, uh, radar at the at the U.S. skiing and snowboarding, and and absolutely created fundamental change. I mean, without a doubt, without weight of gold, um, I, I don't believe that that the change that has uh, that is happening and existing inside the NGB today, that doesn't happen. Uh, I'm confident in, in in saying that you know being having worked with those folks um, at the ground level. So, you know, um, kudos to, to to you for for your courage to make this film. I'm curious as you as you look back like over the past decade and maybe an anecdote worth noting is like when I was competing in the Olympics or playing football, um, nobody was talking about mental health. And, and in fact, if, if, if you were talking about depression or, or struggles you were having, you know, an athlete would probably be excluded from a team. Like you'd be a liability to a football team to, or to, to the Olympics. Maybe you could just, you know, touch on or highlight the progress as a society um, that we have made over the past decade of you know moving more in a direction of normalizing and destigmatizing mental health. Yeah, I think that it's it's happening in real time. I mean, I think that we're creating a a new paradigm right now. You know, the fact that um, Naomi and, and Simone were comfortable using the term mental health um, and are not getting labeled as people who need to be institutionalized or um, it's just a whole new world, you know, and I think that we're, we're figuring out the vocabulary around it. What's mental health and, you know, when do people need to, to go to treatment? When do people need to try medication? What's the, what's the, the, the line between mental health and, and psychiatry? And it's an open conversation, but, um, you know, I just, I just can't help but think how much um, athletes have contributed to the conversation because athletes are such cultural heroes in our society with good reason. They've got tremendous influence. And with the explosion of social media, you know, I think that their channels are more valuable than a lot of the, the, the classic, um, you know, channels that, that we watched as kids and, you know, I know I'm getting so much of my news and information and opinions off social media for better, for worse. And social media has its downside and there's a lot of improvement that needs to go on there because we know that um, certain aspects of it are directly impacting mental health 
in a negative way. And, and hopefully the companies that, um, you know, are these, these leaders in this space can help use those tools in a more positive way. Um, social media is another thing that's kind of unfolding in real time. You know, it's, it's a new ish technology, but, um, I'm just excited to see where, where the conversation goes. I mean, I think of stigma as being, I think of stigma and, uh, the ability to get really frictionless therapy as like the two biggest rocks or barriers and, and, you know, the stigma the the, the access part is trickier, right? I mean, hopefully telehealth helps. But the stigma part, I feel like we've gotten this traction now, like, okay, athletes talking about the issue in a great story and getting it out in a powerful way, making sure people know about it, putting a conversation around it actually works. So now like my biggest focus and, and Podium's biggest focus is, is doing more of that. And so every day we're recruiting more athletes from different sports and coming up with content and campaigns to be able to attack that stigma some more. Yeah, I mean, kudos to you for starting Podium Pictures and re really as with the mission um, to inspire positive change. You, you touched on it a little bit, but curious, what, you know, what are the next projects? What are, you, what are you thinking about working on next? Yeah, first and foremost, it's, it's you know, attacking this mental health stigma and, and continuing. We've really been, um, we've been integrating a very research-driven approach, um, which as a a long time, you know, producer or filmmakers, not the way that I'm used to, to doing things, but the way the company is evolving, it's like, let's really dig in. So, you know, we're looking at what are the specific demographics in just starting with America where we feel like there's a real need. Um, you know, the African-American community, for example, is a place where there's still a lot of stigma. So how can we create a campaign driven by content that can actually move the needle? So, you know, we're working with uh, an NBA star to, to put together something there. We're working with Dale Earnhardt Jr. to do something in NASCAR Nation, as we call it. Um, we're working with, with Bodie Miller and hopefully with you uh, to do something focused in the Rocky Mountains, where, you know, eight of the top 10 states in the country when it comes to suicide are in the Rocky Mountains. Like, let's put some focused energy and love there through a Warren Miller ski tour and a film that um, that speaks to that audience, you know, where they are. And it's an interesting thing. I mean, in, in coming from production and, and with, with the weight of gold, we were so fortunate to, to find an incredible partner in, in HBO and Warner Media. Um, but like, we also would like to make certain films available for free to everybody in the world, you know, to make them, to be able to have some kid in India, like be able to watch everything on his phone that we do you know, that's, that's a goal too. So we want to find the right partners and platforms to do that. But beyond mental health, you know, there, there's other issues that, um, that need to be addressed and, and, and we want to address. And we think through the power of, of athletes and storytelling and we can address. So um, it looks like we're going to be doing a big title nine film um, in 2022 with an, an, a WNBA star who brought that project to us. Um, we also want to do stuff around the environment and uh and racial justice as well so we got a lot cooking final question uh from from my side brett but you know i know i know you poured your heart and soul into the way to gold I, I know you you gave it everything that you possibly had you've obviously seen a lot of good change come out of it um i see one emmy uh behind you i'm curious what it felt like to be nominated for a second emmy uh with the way to gold yeah, it felt good to be nominated for the Emmy. I mean, certainly it's something that, um, you know, from a production standpoint, a film standpoint is, is one of the, one of the things that, you know, it, it's nice to get acknowledged. Um, and I hope to, you know, Emmys are nice, but look, the fact that we made the impact we did in the Olympic world, and I think it's expanding to the IOC level based on, you know, some of the things I was reading around Tokyo and, and then I need to learn more about the fact that billions of people got to hear it's okay not to be okay from, from you and Michael and Apollo and Sean and Lolo and Bodhi and all these great athletes and people in this film, you know, that's worth 
every Emmy in the world. Um, you know, and, and before we wrap up, I just, I have to acknowledge and, you know, I've done it before and I'll do it every time we talk, like this film would not have happened without you. I'm very aware of, you know, the, the, what, what moved the goalpost forward, um, during this process and, you know, you, you raising your hand and, and, um, going out to your network, not just of, uh, of athletes, but people who would, you know, help, help with some funding, um, you know, moved, moved it up the field in a way it wouldn't have otherwise. So, uh, very grateful for that. I want to say thank you to the Kennedy Forum for having us. Thank you to all of you who have tuned in for our chat. And Brett, as as always, it's it's great to see you. And I think on behalf of all of us, thank you for the great work that you're you're doing, not only with the way to gold, but that you will continue to do um, to create good change in the world. Thank you. Appreciate it. Let's do some more together. Absolutely.